Welcome to Clickhole Wednesday, a casual hump day hangout that takes less time to edit than my other shit. Hello macaronis and gentlemen, welcome back to our midweek random exploration of god knows what on Wikipedia. Surely we are soon to find out where it is exactly our clickhole will take us. We've had no suggestions to start this clickhole since Tony's creepy maggot cheese. I know that one is a really hard one to outdo, but please do feel free to suggest something. Otherwise, we're just gonna go ahead and start with something random. Alright, hold on to your butts. Um, tobacco smoke enema. <laughs> That is one of the most random beginnings I think we've ever had. Well, I, I did say hold on to your butts. <laughs> I guess that was, um, that had some foresight to it. Okay, here we go. A tobacco smoke enema, an insufflation of tobacco smoke into the rectum, i.e. as an enema, was employed by the indigenous peoples of North America to stimulate respiration, injecting the smoke with a rectal tube. Later, Europeans emulated the Americans. Tobacco resuscitation kits consisting of a pair of bellows and a tube were provided by the Royal Humane Society of London and placed at various points along the Thames. What, like a like a porta potty but for sticking tobacco up your butt? Okay. European physicians furthermore employed these enemas for a range of ailments. Tobacco was recognized by Europeans as a medicine. Oh how times have changed. Soon after it was first deported from the New World, and tobacco smoke was used by Western medical practitioners as a tool against cold and drowsiness. During the 19th century, the practice fell into decline when it was discovered that the principal active agent in tobacco smoke, nicotine, is poisonous. <laughs> but for some, what, 200 years, they enjoyed putting tobacco smoke up their bums? Good. Contemporary veterinary use of these enemas by Catawba Native Americans for horses needing laxatives has been reported by US anthropologist Frank Speck. Really? So when horses are constipated, they use a tobacco smoke enema? Who knew? Pliny the Elder used the inhalation of smoke as a cure for coughs. That's changed. For a short period, tobacco became a panacea. Isn't panacea like a cure-all? Yeah. A supposed remedy that is claimed to cure all diseases and prolong life indefinitely. Wow, what a joke. That is unfortunate. In an attempt to discourage disease, tobacco was also used to fumigate buildings. As somebody who really does not enjoy the smell of tobacco smoke, this sounds like a nightmare time to be alive. Oh my god. To physicians of the time, the appropriate treatment for apparent death was warmth and stimulation. Anne Green, a woman sentenced to death and hanged in 1650 for the supposed murder of her stillborn child, was found by anatomists to still be alive. They revived her by pouring hot cordial down her throat, rubbing her limbs and extremities, bleeding her, applying heated pl heating plasters, and a heating odoriferous clyster to be cast up in her body to give heat and warmth to her bowels. After placing her in a warm bed with another woman to keep her warm, she recovered fully and was pardoned. It, it was clearly down to the smoking her anus was doing. So the use of smoke enemas in Western medicine declined after 1811, when through animal experimentation, Benjamin Brody demonstrated that nicotine is a cardiac poison that can stop circulation of the blood. Well, that must have really shocked people. I wonder if he had a lot of pushback on that study. I bet he did. I bet there were people that were like, no, we really want our smoke animals, please. Okay, well, where to go from here? I am tempted by, where is she? Anne Green, the woman sentenced to death and revived. And I'm also interested in Benjamin Brody. No, let's learn a bit more about Anne Green, the woman who was revived by smoke in her butt. Anne Green was an English domestic servant who was accused of committing infanticide in 1650. She is notable for surviving her attempted execution. There's a woodcut. Born around 1628, she worked as a scullery maid, which is the lowest ranked maid. In the house of Sir Thomas Reed, when she was 22, she claimed that she was often solicited by fair promises and other amorous enticements by Sir Thomas's grandson, who was 16 or 17, and that she was seduced by him, and thus she became pregnant. Though she claimed she was not aware of her pregnancy until she miscarried in the privy after 17 weeks. She tried to conceal the remains, but was discovered and suspected of infanticide. But a midwife testified that the fetus was too underdeveloped to have ever been alive. So she probably did miscarry. But no, ignore the midwife and ignore all the other servants because they know nothing, so she was hanged. <laughs> 
of course. At her own request, several of her friends pulled at her swinging body and a soldier struck her four or five times with the butt of his musket to expedite her death and dispatch her out of her pain. After half an hour, she was cut down and then was given to Oxford University for dissection. They opened her coffin the next day and found she had a faint pulse and was weakly breathing. She began to recover quickly, speaking after 12 to 14 hours of treatment and ate solid food after four days. And within one month, she had fully recovered aside from amnesia surrounding the time of her execution. Well, thank God for that. That's all I can say. That is a blessing. That is not something you'd want to remember at all. So she was then granted a reprieve and was ultimately pardoned, believing the hand of God had saved her. Some people said she should have just been hanged again. After her recovery, Green went to stay with friends in the country, taking the coffin with her. That's interesting. Why? It doesn't say what she did with it. Was it just like a reminder? Or did she save it for when she was actually buried? That's interesting. Anyway, she married, had three children, and died in 1659. That's a very short life. Well, there you go. Let's check out Duns Tew, where she worked and all this went down. Duns Tew is a village and civil parish about seven and a half miles south of Banbury in Oxfordshire. With nearby Great Tew and Little Tew, Duns Tew is one of the three villages known collectively as the Tews. A Tew is believed to be an ancient term for a ridge of land. Looks very cute. Let's have a look at this picture. Nice. I wonder how old this church is, as we'll find out. Gosh, it's old. Even before the Norman conquest, there was a manor owned by Leof Wine of Barton. Present manor house contains 17th century remnants and a wing added in the 19th century. The main part of the present house is 18th century. House has a 17th century dove coat, a structure intended to house pigeons or doves. Oh, right. Ooh, that's fun. So that church existed in the 12th century. Wow. God, it did quite well. Oh, from which period the font and one early English Gothic lancet window in the chancel survive. The north aisle was added late in the 13th or early in the 14th century. Oh, I love these roofs. That's so English. Little thatched cottage roof. Oh, there's Anne Green. She is a notable part of the economic and social history. There are no shops in Duns to you, but there is a pub called the White Horse. Every other pub is called White Horse. I'm sad that that's not original. And it has a community action group. Ooh, big stuff. Let's check out the dovecote. Dovecote or dovecot or columbarium is a structure intended to house pigeons or doves. Dovecots may be freestanding structures in a variety of shapes or built into the end of a house or barn. They contain pigeon holes for the birds to nest. Oh, they were an important food source. I thought it was for messenger pigeons, but I suppose... <laughs> I suppose that's more productive. How many people actually had messenger pigeons? I, I feel stupid that I didn't assume that people kept them for food first. It totally makes sense. They were kept for their eggs and dung. What do they do with the dung? Do they use it as fertilizer? Ooh, that's a beautiful one. I love the different styles depending on the location. I do like architecture. Oh, Estonia has one. The Estonia one looks like there's a buried castle underground and this is just like a tower peeking out. Oh, this one could do with a bit of fixing. <laughs> that's a very rough looking one. Ooh, a motorized one in World War One. Technology. Ooh, that's a cool one too. Where's that? Dieppe. Oh, in France. Wow, that's French. This does not look French to me. How interesting. Okay, let's see. They have been used everywhere. The oldest ones are the fortified ones of Upper Egypt and the domed ones in Iran. Yes, fertilizer is what the droppings are for. Pigeon droppings were also used for leather tanning and making gunpowder. Really? Well, I suppose it's flammable fertilizer. In some cultures, particularly medieval Europe, the possession of a dovecoat was a symbol of status and power and was consequently regulated by law. Only nobles had this special privilege Way to keep society down by not being able to house their own food. Many ancient manors in France and the UK still have them, either in standing or in ruins. The Lord's pigeons were often seen as a nuisance by nearby peasant farmers, in particular when sowing new crops. In numerous regions in France, where the right to possess a dovecoat was reserved solely for the nobility, the complaint rules very frequently recorded formal requests for the suppression of this privilege and a law for its abolition was finally ratified in 1789. Wow, the largest dovecotes in Persia could house 14,000 birds. That's like a bird city. And they were decorated in distinctive red bands so as to be easily recognizable to the pigeons. Where's that one that was from Iran? Did it have one? I wonder if this band was red. It might have been. God, every country has a story about them. 
almost looks like a wine cellar <laughs> with all the holes for the dubs to be in. Ah, uh, the urban ducot. Yes, not as not as attractive anymore, unfortunately. Modernity doesn't bring you taste all the time. I'm drawn to this one in particular. I just really like the design. So let's check out Najafabad in Iran. Najafabad is a city and capital of Najafabad County, Isfahan Province, Iran. The 2016 census, its population was nearly 300,000. It is noted for its pomegranates and almonds. Mmm, nice. It's so far inland, but they have dolphins on the fort? Why? Wait, isn't that the... that looks like the... the... the dovecote. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it totally is. Wait, maybe not. Well, it looks like it. Oh, that's it. Well, that narrows it down. Mustafa Moeen. Iranian politician, professor of pediatrics, and human rights activist. Yeah, let's take a look at him. All right. Uh, he's currently the founder and president of Center for Human Rights and Democracy in Iran. He was a presidential candidate for the 2005 Iranian presidential election. His campaign enjoyed the support of some reformist parties and organizations. Currently, he's the director of immunology, asthma, and allergy research institute affiliated to Tehran University of Medical Scientist. Tums! <laughs> Their acronym is Tums. If only he worked in gastroenterology instead. So he was born in 1951. At the age of 18, he was accepted into medical school. And after the Iranian Revolution, he was appointed as the president of Shiraz University, where he went to school. He was elected as representative of Shiraz in midterm elections of the first parliament of Iran in 1982. He was the minister of culture and higher education in the early 90s, and then again in the late 90s. And later became the Minister of Science, Research and Technology, but he resigned after the student protests of July 1999, and again in 2003, after he failed to persuade the Council of Guardians to redirect his ministry towards his vision of higher scientific productivity. Damn, he's he's been busy. He's been a busy man. What the hell is the Council of Guardians? Let's check that out. The Guardian Council is an appointed and constitutionally mandated 12-member council that wields considerable power and influence in the Islamic Republic of Iran. That sounds like video game level. That is intense. Anybody play Destiny? Because this seems appropriate. The Iranian constitution calls for the council to be composed of six Islamic faqis, which are experts in Islamic law, conscious of the present needs and issues of the day, be selected by the supreme leader, and, s and six jurists, specializing in different areas of law to be elected by the majlis. Majlis? From jurists nominated by the head of the judiciary. Oh, I see. So you've got 12 people selected as religious experts and six people selected as experts in the more secular law, I guess. Okay, so the council has played a central role in controlling the interpretation of Islamic values in Iranian law in the following ways. They oversee surveillance of potential candidates and determine who can and cannot run for national office. Ew. Well, no wonder the last guy we looked at had a problem because he advocated for democracy and that doesn't sound very democratic. They also disqualify reform-minded candidates. Oh, well, yeah, there you go. That was his thing, reform including the most well-known candidates from running for office. They veto laws passed by the, popular, the popularly elected Majlis and they increase the influence that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps has on the economic and cultural life of the country. That is, that is just as intense as Guardian Council sounded. So people criticize it for increasing the role of the army in everyday life, arbitrarily disqualifying candidates from elections, and that you end up with rule by unelected leaders. Well, that's what they're there to keep in place, I guess. Political groups, Combatant Clergy Association, a politically active group in Iran, but not a political party in the traditional sense. Combatant Clergy? Holy balls, we gotta click on that. It has never been registered as a political party. However, it acts as a fragmented caucus and has actively operated in the electoral arena, competing for votes. Oh, it's considered an elite party and can be thus classified as a political party according to the minimalist definition. The organization has great influence over non-elective institutions such as the judicial system, the Guardian Council, and the Revolutionary Guard Corps. Dang. Let's check out the General Secretary, Mustafa Pur Mohammadi. He is an Iranian politician and prosecutor who has served at different positions and cabinet posts. He was Minister of Interior and Minister of Justice. He is reportedly implicated in the 1988 massacre of Iranian prisoners. What? Jesus. What the heck is that? A series of state-sponsored execution of political prisoners across Iran, lasting for approximately five months. 
How many people died? Between 2800 and 3800, but an alternative estimation suggests that number exceeded 30,000. Because of the large number, prisoners were loaded into forklift trucks in groups of six and hanged from cranes at, in half hour intervals. That is horrendous. I regret clicking on this. I'm trying to escape this by going to a cemetery. Caravan Cemetery. Unmarked cemetery in southeast Tehran. The graves in the cemetery do not have any marking on them. That would be what unmarked means. Families of the dead are not allowed to mourn there. That's pretty terrible. Let's go to the Iran portal. Ooh, random portal. Please tell me more. What will we get? <laughs> Straight to the portal of freedom of speech. <laughs> That's quite the change after what we've just been through. Moro de Moro, an Italian investigative journalist. Originally a supporter of Mussolini's fascist regime, de Moro became a journalist with a left-leaning newspaper. He disappeared and his body's never been found. Well, I think we all know what happened there, that's for sure. He was born into a reputable family of doctors and pharmacists. His mother was a math teacher. His younger brother was a linguist and politician. Ooh, who became minister of education in... What? Wow, he was old. He was first to publish a detailed map of the Mafia, which was confirmed 22 years later by the Mafia Pentito, or turncoat, Tommaso Buscetta, in his testimony. That's impressive. Of course he became a target for the Mafia. He was a walking corpse, said Buscetta. Cosa Nostra had been forced to forgive the journalist because his death would arouse too much suspicion, but at the first opportunity he would have to pay for the scoop. Well, then, looks like he had a lot of targets, this guy. So he was kidnapped while coming home from work, and in response, thousands of police, helicopters, dogs, combed Sicily in vain in search of him. His body has never been found, a victim of the so-called Lupara Bianca, a journalistic term to indicate a mafia slaying done in such a way that the victim's body is never found. Hmm, didn't know there was a phrase for that. This reads like a fictional novel, it's insane. So apparently Damore investigated the death of Enrico Mattei, who was the powerful president of Italy's state-owned oil and gas conglomerate. While Mattei was president of the oil and gas conglomerate, he tried to break the oligopoly of the Seven Sisters, a term he coined to refer to the dominant oil companies of the mid-20th century. And in 1959, in the middle of the Cold War, brokered an oil import deal with the Soviet Union over intense protests from the US and NATO, while supporting independent its movements against colonial power such as Algeria. So de Moore investigated it, actually upon request of a movie director for a film, and he was convinced that his plane had been sabotaged and looked into possible links between the Mafia and the crash. The reason why the Mafia is in this is because a politician and Matei's former right-hand man knew a Mafia boss really well. He'd actually been best man at his wedding, and he'd been on a on a plane with Mattei the day before it crashed. And Bouchetta said that Mattei was killed at the request of the American Mafia because his oil policies had hurt US interest in the Middle East. So the American Mafia was in turn possibly doing a favor to the Seven Sisters. So De Moro had dug up that info. So that would be why the Mafia went after De Moro. And the only guy they seemed to have charged was acquitted because of insufficient evidence. His disappearance and likely death remains one of the unsolved mysteries in Italian history. List of people who disappeared. Oh boy, this is a long list. Oh my god. <laughs> Let's see, prior to 1970. Romulus, the founder and first king of Rome. He was at least 60. One day Romulus was reviewing his troops, there was a sudden storm. A thick black cloud hid him from view and no one ever saw him again. Romulus's generals may have used the opportunity to assassinate him. Yeah, I imagine 700 BC. I mean, come on. <laughs> I don't think a black cloud swooped down and took away Romulus. I think he was probably killed. And people were like, oh, a black cloud came down and hid him and he disappeared. It's amazing what people believed. Oh, there's a lot of really interesting, interesting disappearances here. This is an excellent page. I could be lost here forever. Here's an interesting one. Ida Hillis Addis, a translator of ancient Mexican narratives, escaped from an insane asylum in California where her husband had her confined during their divorce and was not seen again. Do tell us more. So she was born in Kansas in 1857, but she moved to Chihuahua, Mexico after the American Civil War started. She was the daughter of a photographer and roamed the western frontier in Mexican wilderness, assisting her father. When she was 15, she and her family moved to Los Angeles where she graduated with the first class of Los Angeles High School. She had seven students. 
She wrote many short stories drawn from Mexican oral sources as well as fiction. Her writings included ghost tales, visitations of the unseen, tragic love triangles, and stories that presaged American feminism. Her work was appearing in a lot of publications, and a lot of those publications took advantage of the fact that she traveled a lot to employ her as a travel writer. She was introduced to former California governor John Downey in his late 60s, and when his sisters discovered that he and Addis had become engaged, they shanghaied him to Ireland, leaving Addis to sue for breach of promise. Before the trial, Addis left San Francisco for Mexico City to write for a bilingual newspaper, and the editor became distracted with her wit and charm. And so his wife, Ursula, sued for divorce and named Addis as a co-defendant. In his testimony, he admitted to committing adultery, but not with Addis. Interesting. So this was an unfortunate bit of unfavorable publicity for a young lady at the time. So she left for Santa Barbara in California, and she began collecting material about prominent citizenry for a book of biographies. During her interviews, she met and shortly afterward married Charles A. Stork, a local attorney and owner of the Santa Barbara News Press. Interestingly enough, he was attracted to her for her good social standing, which is exactly why she ended up in Santa Barbara. Maybe he didn't know why she was there? They got married, but he treated her terribly, and so did his son. She accused him of peculiar intimate behaviors and violence. He retaliated with a divorce complaint on the grounds that she was insane, and the trial was resolved in his favor. During the divorce, she discovered that her attorney was in duplicity with her husband. Yikes, that sucks. When she discovered the duplicity, she broke into his home, her lawyer's home, with two revolvers and threatened to shoot him. One bullet was fired, but it only hit the floor. He overpowered her, called the police, she was sent to jail. She also claimed to have been married to him, but she spent eight months in prison and then was sentenced to serve a year in a libel case, uh, but served 10 months and was released with two months credit time. When she was released, the divorce was not final and she requested alimony. At this time, Clara Shortridge Foltz, who was the first female lawyer on the West Coast and the pioneer of the idea of the public defense, okay, we're gonna go there in a minute, stepped in to briefly defend her. Stork refused to pay the alimony and had her committed to an insane asylum from where she escaped and disappeared. Oh, but there's no details on that, which is what I came here for. Let's check out Clara Shortridge Foltz. She was an American lawyer, the first female lawyer on the West Coast, and the pioneer of the idea of the public defender. Man, I bet she had really good intentions with that, but now they're just useless and just want to close cases. That sucks. The criminal court's building in downtown Los Angeles was renamed after her in 2002 and is now known as the Clara Shortridge Faults Criminal Justice Center. Wow, she died at quite a good old age. She was actually born in Indiana. Prior to the Civil War, they moved to Iowa, where she attended a co-educational school. At age 15, she eloped with a farmer and a Civil War veteran, and they began having children, but he could not support the family, so they moved a lot, at first to Portland, then to San Jose, and she wrote for papers. Then her husband deserted her and their five kids, so she began studying law in the office of a local judge, in part through the support of local suffragette Sarah Knox Goodrich. She also supported herself by giving public lectures, starting in 1877, on suffrage. God, that's a hard life. She wanted to take the California bar exam, but at the time it only allowed white males to become members of the bar. So she authored a state bill, known as the Woman Lawyer Bill, which replaced white male with person. How inclusive. And in September 18, 1878, she passed and was the first woman admitted to the California bar and the first female lawyer in the entire West Coast of the US. With little formal education, she wished to study at the first law school in California to improve her skills. She was not allowed to go to law school because she was female. <laughs> But so she sued and won. She sued to go to law school and won. That's epic. It was her destiny to be a lawyer. Unfortunately, the work to win the case left her impoverished and she returned to her legal career instead of pursuing her dream of attending law school. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, she had quite a few firsts to her name. Wow. First woman appointed to the State Board of Corrections, first female clerk for the State Assembly's Judiciary Committee, the first female licensed notary public, the first woman named a director of a major bank, and in 1930, the first woman to run for governor of California at the age of 81. Holy shit, that is a self-made woman. That is impressive. And now she's buried in Inglewood Park Cemetery in LA. Wow, that's a good note to end on. Clara Shortridge Faults, what a legend. We started off 500 years ago with tobacco smoke enemas, which is truly bizarre, and I'm glad we don't do those anymore. Imagine people farting cigarettes, how horrific. 
From there, we went to a woman who was resuscitated after being hanged for infanticide, to dove coats, and adventuring around some strange elements of Iranian politics, before reading about some interesting individuals who disappeared and worked in journalism for ending on Clara Shortridge Faults, a woman of many firsts. So if you enjoyed this click hole, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. I appreciate you having a listen, having a watch. Stay tuned for a video on Saturday. Feel free to leave a recommendation for our next click hole, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.